Welcome back to the Chord by Chord series. Today, we're taking a deep dive into one of the most misunderstood diatonic triads, the seven diminished six chord, the diminished leading tone triad in first inversion. The upper voices are on scale degrees seven, two, and four, and the bass is on scale degree two. It actually sounds the same in major and minor keys, since minor uses the raised leading tone, and two and four are the same in major and minor keys. Notice that the third is the standard doubling here. More on that in a minute. You've already seen this chord in action in the past two episodes, connecting one and one six with stepwise motion in all four voices, using either voice exchange or parallel tenths. But today we're going deeper. Where this chord came from, why it behaves the way it does, why it's a different dominant chord than five, and why it's almost always found in first inversion. Let's start with that last fact first. In Western music, the bass line controls the harmony. All of the other notes have to work with it. So let's look at the three positions of the leading tone triad and how the upper voices relate to the bass. A root position seven chord has a minor third and a diminished fifth, a tritone, above the bass. The tritone is the most dissonant interval, so building a stable chord with this bass note isn't possible. While you might come across this chord position every once in a while, it's super rare. But in first inversion, the chord's fifth is now a minor third above the bass, and the root a major sixth. Both intervals are consonant with the bass, even though they form a tritone against each other. The tritone in the upper voices was considered acceptable because it didn't involve the bass note. A 764, however, would place an augmented fourth, another tritone, above the bass, a dissonance stacked inside an already unstable 6 4 position. So, in traditional four part writing, you'll almost never see this inversion either. That's why the 7 6 and not the root position or 6 4 versions became the standard form in tonal music. This unique structure of the diminished triad also plays a role in doubling. The 7-6 chord usually has its third doubled, scale degree 2, since that note is consonant with the bass and with the other two notes of the chord. Some people go so far as to say that you always double the third of a diminished triad for this reason, but that's not quite true. We'll see that composers also sometimes double the fifth in order to make smoother connections, like in our parallel tenths connection from the last video. This makes the upper voices a little more dissonant because now there are two tritones up there, but it's still allowed. What's not allowed is doubling the root, because that's the leading tone. Now let's take a look at where this chord came from. It grew out of the standard way of ending a two-voice phrase in Renaissance counterpoint, called the clausula vera, or true close. In that formula, both voices move by step towards the final. The lower voice descends two to one, and the upper voice ascends seven to one. This is the ancestor of most of our standard cadences, perfect authentic cadences, imperfect authentic cadences, and even the deceptive cadence, which we'll learn about soon. Now imagine adding a third voice to the clausula vera, keeping the two one line as the lowest voice. Scale degree seven is a sixth above two, so the only other consonance that works here is the note that's a third above two, which is scale degree four. And suddenly, you have 7, 2, and 4, the notes of a 7, 6 chord. When this resolves, 4 typically moves down to 3, forming a tonic triad. And every voice moves by step. This three-voice cadence perfectly encapsulates what the 7, 6 chord is all about. Smooth, stepwise voice leading in all voices towards the tonic. But hopefully this all reminds you of another chord that you already know. In fact, we can take these three voices and add a new bass line and turn this into a 5 7 to 1 progression. The 7 triad contains scale degrees 7, 2, and 4, which are the three upper notes of a 5 7 chord. All that's missing is the root on scale degree 5. In fact, some theorists call the 7 chord a rootless 5 7. I get why, but I don't think that that's how composers of the common practice era thought of them. Both chords have dominant function and often connect 1 to 1 6, but their origins are different. The 7 6 chord came from adding another voice above the 2 1 clausula vera motion. The 
the V chord came from adding a lower voice beneath the clausula vera. The only scale degree consonant below both two and seven is five, creating the five triad. But that's still just a triad, not a seventh chord. We still need a few more steps to get there. In four voices, composers added another upper voice, moving five to three, doubling the root of the five chord, and then ending on a one chord with three roots and one third, instead of just the bare octave. Finally, they began filling in that five to three line with a passing tone on scale degree four. That moment, with 5, 7, 2, and 4 all present, came to be understood as a new type of chord with 4 notes instead of 3, the 7th chord. So from a modern standpoint, the 5-7 chord is the dominant, dominant chord. It has both strong voice leading and a strong harmonic pull towards 1, and we see it everywhere now. But the 7-6 chord was never just a 5-7 chord with a note missing. It's its own thing that actually predated 7th chords completely. It's a lighter dominant chord with strong voice leading into 1, but without that grounding 5 to 1 harmonic strength. So while they both clearly pull towards the tonic and can sometimes be used interchangeably and sound very similar, their origins are different and composers use them differently. Now let's take a look at some real examples in Bach chorales you'll often see the 7-6 chord as part of a very stepwise bass line. First up is chorale number three in A minor, featuring one to 7-6 to 1-6, with the melody moving 3-2-1 and the bass moving 1-2-3, creating voice exchange between the two voices. This could just as easily have been a passing 5-6-4 chord if the tenor had stayed on scale degree 5 the whole time, but Bach deliberately chose the 7-6 chord instead. And check out the whole bass line in this. It's entirely stepwise except for those leaps between 5 and 1 at the beginning and the end of the phrase. Listen again and pay attention to how the 7-6 chord really smooths out the whole connection. Next up, chorale 244 in C minor. Same progression, but in reverse. Here we have 1 6, 7 6, 1, and voice exchange between the bass and tenor. Again, the 7 6 chord could just as easily have been a passing 5 6 4 by keeping the alto on scale degree 5 through all three chords, but he chose that 7 6 chord instead, presumably for its darker qualities. Listen again and note how super stepwise everything is. Now let's look at some examples with parallel tenths. In chorale 26 in F major, the soprano moves three, four, five with the basses one, two, three. But we also see the tenor moving five, four, three, creating voice exchange with the soprano. This is the usual way that we'll encounter the fifth of the 7-6 chord being doubled. In this case, it's the B-flat, and then those two voices step in opposite directions. Listen again and note how the parallel tenths help drive the melody up towards the final cadence. We see the same progression in reverse in chorale 178 in G minor, this time harmonizing a descending 5-4-3 melody on its way to scale degree 2 at the end of a phrase. Again, the soprano and tenor end up doubling the fifth of the chord and then stepping in opposite directions. Listen again, and this time try to zero in on the tenor line. Mm -hmm. 
This right here is the biggest difference between the 7-6 chord and inversions of 5-7. When composers use 7-6, they sometimes double the fifth of the chord, which is scale degree 4, and 4 frequently steps up to 5. In a 5-7 chord, composers would never double scale degree 4, which is the chordal 7th, let alone allow it to go up to 5 instead of resolve down to 3, except in that one exception involving ascending parallel tenths that I showed you in the previous video. Okay, those examples all showed 7-6 connecting 1 with 1-6, which we talked about in the previous two videos. But since 7-6 is in the dominant family, it can also be approached by predominant chords, like 4 and 2. Let's see how 4 moves to 7-6. They both contain scale degree 4, so one voice can stay on 4 through both chords, while the other two upper voices step up, 1 to 2 and 6 to 7. And that leaves our bass leaping down from 4 to 2. The connection between 2 and 7 is even smoother because they share two notes in common. Both the bass and another voice stay on scale degree 2, and another voice stays on scale degree 4. That leaves one remaining voice that can turn a 2 chord into a 7-6 just by moving one note, scale degree 6 up to 7. Now, be careful. This all works effortlessly in major keys, but in minor, it's trickier. In minor keys, the 4 chord is minor and the 2 chord is diminished. They both contain lowered scale degree 6, or A flat in the key of C minor. Moving from A flat to B natural, lowered 6 to raised 7, is a melodic augmented second. And composers avoided this because it was a difficult interval to tune. Listen closely to the top voice. So when composers do do this in minor keys, they also raise scale degree 6. A flat becomes A natural, following the melodic minor scale, turning the 4 chord major and the 2 chord minor, which then both look and sound the same way they do in major keys. But this is rare, so today we're just going to focus on the major key versions. Let's see how Bach does it. In chorale 103 in B flat major, he harmonizes the 1, 2, 3 melody with 4, 7, 6, 1, connecting the 4 and the 7, 6 chord in the bass with a passing tone on scale degree 3. And pay close attention to the melody and the bass throughout the phrase. They're both moving in stepwise contrary motion the entire time, thanks to a few passing tones. This progression, 4, 7, 6, 1, is a great way to harmonize a melody moving either 1, 2, 3, or 6, 7, 1 with contrary motion in the bass. Now, let's see how he handles moving from 2 to 7, 6. This is really slick. In the final phrase of chorale 363 in A major, he harmonizes a 1, 2, 3 melody with 3, 2, 1 in the bass, but the chords here are 1, 6, 2, 1. But take a closer look at the 2 chord, the alto steps from 6 to 7, turning that 2 chord into a 7-6 chord at the last minute. Now, it might not even occur to you to analyze that G-sharp in the alto as anything other than a passing tone. But in this style, composers almost never move from root position 2 to root position 1. So Bach moves from 1-6 to 2, which is typical, and then turns that 2 chord into a 7-6 by moving just one note. And then that 7-6 chord takes us to its usual destination, 1. Listen again and focus on how that one alto note changes the entire harmonic direction. So that's the 7-6 chord in a nutshell. It's almost always in first inversion so that none of the chord members are dissonant with the bass. It always leads into 1 or 1-6 one with stepwise motion. Composers usually approach it from 1, 1-6, one 4, or 2. And it's not just a rootless 5-7 chord, though they share many similarities. Not only are the origins of the 7-6 and 5-7 chords completely different, 
but the 7-6 chord can do two things that 5-7 chords don't. Double scale degree 4 and allow scale degree 4 to step up to 5. Clearly, 7-6 follows its own voice leading logic, independent of the 5-7 chord. Thanks for watching. In the next episode, we'll close out the dominant family with its third inversion, the 5-4-2 chord, where the bass takes the chordal seventh. See you next time on Dr. Fromm's Music Lab.